one patient that came to see me this terrible situation. A chiropractor in his early 60s was an athlete his whole life, power athlete, runner, um, biker, blah, blah, blah. And the guy all of a sudden started developing arrhythmias, very bad tachycardia. Um, and um, he can't walk up a flight of stairs now, at least for a while. He could not even walk up a flight of stairs without having an arrhythmia. Now he's starting to get better, okay, through special diet, special supplementation. Um, but he really hurt himself from, from all that workouts. And everybody's different. Some people can tolerate more than others. God bless you that you've run 21 marathons, okay? But you just never know when you're gonna, when you're gonna hit the wall there. So there's a bunch of articles that I have now on cardiac autonomic imbalance in order to, and this is one particular athlete. Conclusion, the shift towards increased heart rate variability, particularly in the high frequency range, together with the reduced resting heart rate, suggests a cardiac autonomic imbalance with extensive parasympathetic modulation in this athlete when overtrained. The heart rate slows down, and it can also cause other symptoms as well. Here's other articles on effective endurance exercise and autonomic control of the heart. Long-term endurance training significantly influences how the autonomic nervous system controls heart function. Endurance training increases parasympathetic activity and decreases sympathetic activity in the human heart at rest. Okay, so um, that was number four. Okay, that the slow heartbeat in an athlete is not a desirable thing. Should we train to a target heart rate, 65%, 70%? That's your question, right? What is the heart rate? It depends on the person, but this, this is actually another myth. I should have put this as a myth. Oh, we, we need to exercise to a certain heart rate. Now, when you do a sprint, sprint interval training, you're not, you're not counting how fast your heart's going. It's probably going over 200 beats a minute. I would, you know, it's not the, it is not the intensity that hurts your heart. It is the volume that hurts your heart. You will fatigue your heart and other parts of your body with volume, not intensity. Yeah. Now, does that mean that you should go out if you have heart problems and, and go start running sprints? No, you need to make sure that you're going to be, not hurt yourself, okay? Um, and I'm not suggesting anybody do anything. You need to check with your doctor, Okay. But, and we'll talk about sprint interval training in a little while. But no, you, target heart rates are not really what you're looking for. So next myth. Exercising a body part will reduce the amount of fat on that part. Okay, oh, I don't like my legs, they're fat. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do you know, exercises on my legs. My arms are too flabby. I'm gonna work on tricep exercises. You cannot reduce fat on any particular part of your body, if you want to lose weight, on any part of your body, you must lose weight overall. Your body doesn't know where that fat's coming from. Now you can build muscle and under the, you know, on your arm, obviously, and your arm will get bigger, your legs will get bigger, okay, because there's more muscle, but you will not lose fat on a body part. Spot fat reduction does not work. Yes, sir? But don't you uh, turn that uh, fat into muscle uh, when you're exercising it? That specific body No. Part? Fat is fat and muscle is muscle. These are totally different you're things. you burning it off? Well, you're burning off, but you'll burn it off your waist and burn it off your face, burn off your legs, burn off your toes. It burns off everywhere. I'm talking about spot fat reduction. If you want your arms, if you have flabby arms and there's too much fat in your arms, you need to lose weight everywhere in order to get your arms smaller. That, that's the point. And then exercise to build a muscle? Is that sure. what you're saying? Absolutely, yeah. You want to do both. But, but to think that I'm going to lose weight in a particular body part by exercising that body part, it's a myth. And then you see these things on TV, right? All these little gizmos on TV that are just ridiculous. Which leads me to exercise myth number six. Sit-ups and crunches will reduce your waist size. They will not. <laughs> It doesn't. In fact, sit-ups and crunches will build up the abdominal muscles, increasing the size of your waist. How many of you have seen, I don't want to pick on women, but you know, women that should have sort of an hourglass shape, that are very, very athletic, that play sports like basketball or, or you know, these, where they have, they're very strong. They don't tend to have a waist. They have, you know, they don't have the hourglass. They have thick waists. They're strong like bull. When you build up your muscles there, they get bigger. Okay? Sit-ups will make your waist bigger. The muscle gets bigger. Okay? You don't reduce the fat there. 
Yeah, so if you want a big, strong waist, do lots of crunches and sit-ups. It will shorten the muscle and make it bigger. And you will not lose any fat over that area. If you want to spot fat reduce, go get some liposuction or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't do that stuff, okay? But that's the only way to really spot fat reduce. You need to do some technique that's just going to suck it out of there, okay? Oh, there's no doubt that exercising your abdominals will give you good, strong abdominal muscles. And if you want a six-pack or a 12-pack, okay, but it's not going to lose the flab and you're not going to get your waist smaller, okay? That won't happen unless you actually lose weight. By the way, if you do want to do abdominals and you want to lengthen the muscles, there's something called like a Roman chair where you go, you have to hyperextend and come up to about here. If you do crunches and you crunch the muscle, you're actually shortening the muscle. So if you want to do abdominal muscle uh, exercises, you want to do exercises that lengthen the muscle, not shorten the muscle. So you have to hyperextend all the way back and then come up to a more neutral position. Exercise myth number seven. Sports drinks keep you from getting dehydrated and, and enhance athletic performance. This is a bunch of garbage, these sports drinks. Sports drinks actually are high in sugar, usually high fructose corn syrup. They will dehydrate you, dehydrate you and actually worsen your athletic performance. Don't get fooled by this stuff. Drink water. Gatorade is just... They actually came out with a new Gatorade. Have you seen that? Gatorade Light or Gatorade something. Have you heard this? No? Yeah? They've reduced the amount of... Because some people start complaining, my, this stuff is terrible. So they actually reduced the amount of sugar and diluted. They basically took regular Gatorade and added water. Yeah. And now it's new and improved. Yeah. Keep, you know how you keep improving Gatorade? Keep adding more and more water until you just have water. Yeah. It'll be... <laughs> Sports drinks are meant to, to sell. And there's a lot of drinks out there. You're really best off drinking real spring water. There's things out there. Now they have all these fancy vitamin water and this water and fruit O2 and all this junk. I just want to talk about fructose for a moment because maybe some of you have heard this before, but not. Fructose is not the best sugar for you. Now, you've heard that fructose is good for you. Have you heard? Fructose is a very special sugar. It comes out, There's this pathway here. Here's my thing. And it's turned into fat. You cannot burn fructose for energy. It actually becomes triglycerides in your body and turns into fat. So if you're trying to lose weight, get rid of the fructose. Avoid things that have high fructose corn syrup. Where else does fructose come from? Fruit. Fruit, Fruit makes you fat. <laughs> but Doc, I love fruit. Just because you love it doesn't mean it's good for you. It's high in sugar. There we go. It is natural. That doesn't mean it's good for you. That does. Well, fiber is good for you. Okay, just because something is, just because something has things in there that are good for you, does that mean that it's good for you in total? How about this one? Chocolate is good for you because it has it's high in antioxidants. Have you heard that one? Okay, so just because antioxidants are good for you, right? And I'm not arguing. Antioxidants can be very good for you. Just and just because chocolate has antioxidants, does that make the chocolate good for you? Well, no. It's full of sugar, okay? Let's grow up. <laughs> we don't necessarily, you know, you reach a certain point in your life where you stop believing in the tooth fairy and stop believing in Santa Claus maybe, okay? <laughs> don't believe this nonsense that chocolate's actually good for you, okay? Why is it on the top in that with vegetables and, uh, and that pyramid? Why is it up there telling you you should eat so much of that and the vegetables and whatnot? Yeah, why is it the food pyramid was created by food companies to sell food. <laughs> the U.S. Department of Agriculture created the food pyramid to help the agriculture industry be profitable. Those foods at the bottom of the food pyramid, if you look at that, are all carbohydrates. These are high profit, high markup, long shelf life foods.